I don't know if you guys are like me, but sometimes something needs to be said like seven, eight, nine, ten times to me before it finally sinks in. Some of you wives are looking at your husbands like, yep, that's him. Um, it's like sometimes you got to repeat the same thing over and over and over, um, and it finally sinks in. Uh, my wife gets mad at me so much because she will tell me one thing, and I'll say, okay, but then I won't do it, but then someone else will tell me the exact same thing, and it will click, right? And someone just said it in a different way, but my wife says that I don't listen to her. I listen to other people. That's what Hebrews feels like. The author is repeating the same thing over and over and over again. I don't know if you guys remember, but the letter is written to a group of believers who are struggling in their faith. They began to follow Jesus, and the whole world began to oppose them. Family has rejected them. Their friends have turned their backs on them. The government has turned on them. Nothing is working out for them. They've lost land. They lost their jobs. And they're wondering if they want to continue in their faith for Jesus. And so some of them are ready to quit. And so the writer is repeating to them over and over and over. And a lot of these guys came out of a Jewish background, and they're, they're seeing their friends who came to Jesus now turning back and going back to Judaism and back to sacrifices and back to religion, per se. And the writer is saying, listen, what you have in Jesus is so much better. In chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10, he basically repeats himself over and over um, and kept saying this, Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. You don't have to go back. And so what you hear this week is going to sound very similar to what you've been hearing the last several weeks as you hear this. But as I listen to this and as I prepare this message, I realize that we need to hear this over and over and over again. That the gospel, that Jesus is so much better than anything that the world has to offer. And so I pray that this morning that you don't tune out because you've heard this before, but I pray that it would sink into, your, sink into your heart and that you would realize that Jesus is so amazing. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our praise. Just like a lot of you guys, I've got scars. And every scar on my body seems to tell a story. I got a scar on my wrist when I was like eight years old. I went to India and... For some reason, my uncle decided to iron on the bed, and I didn't realize that the iron was on the bed, so I jumped on the bed, and this hot iron fell onto my hand, and it burned my hand. The scar is still there. It hasn't gone. Over 20 years later, it's still there, and that scar tells a story. I was the kid in high school that had pimples all over my face. I was that kid um, where you couldn't see my face because of the pimples, um, and trying to make them go away, I would pop them, and that only made it worse where for many, many years, I had scars all over my forehead because of the pimples that I popped. I have scars. You have scars. Every scar has a story, and these scars are a part of me. They are permanent reminders of stuff in my past that is part of who I am today. Unfortunately, my scars are not limited to just the physical type. Neither are yours. We all have scars on our heart from sin. I got scars from sin in my life, and I have stories of those sins and how sin has messed my life up. I'm not going to get into the juicy details of the things I've done or anything like that this morning, Um, but I want you to know that if I were to tell you some of those stories, they probably will be very similar to some of your stories. They're going to be very similar to stuff that you've gone through. Because when you boil it down, we essentially all share the same story. All of us have sinned, and every one of us have done things that we shouldn't have done. We have said things that we shouldn't have said. We haven't been the person that we should have been. And whether it is greed or envy or jealousy or anger or bad attitudes or unkind words or lust, whatever the sin is, the bottom line is we all have done it. We've all sinned. We all have scars on our hearts and our minds from the sins that we have done and participated in. Sin has left its mark on us. 
We have been transformed or changed because of the sins that we have done. Sin leaves a scar year after year on our lives. And I don't know if you've noticed, maybe you're perfect, but I'm not. But even years after following Jesus, I still struggle with certain sins in my life. There are things that I wrestle with on a consistent basis of God. I don't understand why you don't take this sin from me. I'm praying. I'm doing the things you're calling me to do, but I'm still struggling in these areas of my life. You can probably say that you're good at it. If there's one thing you're good at, it's sinning, right? It's doing the things that you're not supposed to do. We got it down because we do it all our lives. And what happens is those sins leave a scar on our hearts and those scars begin to build up and build up and eventually our hearts become hardened. And all of us, to some degree or another, have hearts that have been hardened because of our sin. And what we try to do is we try to compensate. We try to deal with it. We try to move forward in life with the reality of, that we have sins in our lives. And sometimes what we do is we look at someone else and we say, well, my sin isn't as bad as their sin, so I'm not as bad at them as them, so God must approve of me. And so we compare ourselves to other people to make ourselves feel good. And the reality is that never helps. Because even though we're better than someone else, just because we look better than someone else, it doesn't deal with the issues of our own lives. It doesn't deal with the fact that we're sinners. It doesn't deal with the fact that we keep struggling. So even if you're better than someone else, you're still a screw-up. And so you never resolve that issue. So another thing that we do is we try to focus on the pleasures of sin. The kind of, you can't beat it, so might as well join them attitude. You, you get the frustrations of sin coming into your life that you feel like, I'm never going to win this, so I might as well just give in and enjoy the pleasures of sin. But that never really does any good for us either. Or maybe what you do is you try to do good to outweigh the bad that you do. I'm just going to do better. I'm just going to work harder. I'm just going to get involved in good things so that my good can outweigh the bad. But we discover again and again and again and again that all of these efforts never work to fix the scars that have been left by sin in our lives. The sin never leaves. Scars never disappear. They're constant reminders. They're constant reminders of our failure. They're constant reminders that we can't meet the expectations that God has for us. That's where we live. And I am grateful that our text this morning shows us that God has a much better way for us to deal with sin. Hebrews 10. I want to look at verse 1 through 18 this morning. But look at the first four verses. For since the law has... For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that were continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, will no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sins. You guys ever, you guys have practical jokers that you try to sneak up on someone and scare them, but you're sneaking up on them, but your shadow gives you away. They actually see your shadow and turn around, they catch you before you can scare them. There's a shadow in the Old Testament that signals that something better is coming. Here we are with the scars of sin of our lives. It's scarred. There's marks all over our lives. And around the corner comes a shadow of hope. That's what Hebrews 10 is about. In the Old Testament, there was this system that was in place where the priest would constantly make sacrifices, the blood of bulls and goats for their sins and the sins of their people. It was the way that God prescribed to them to deal with sin. But it was just a shadow, the writer says. It wasn't the remedy for sin. Instead, it was a constant reminder to them that they were sinful. The law, the first system, was a constant reminder of their problem of sin. They could try to do better. They can offer sacrifices. They can keep coming back over and over and over again. But all they could do, but they could never remedy the problem of sin. They could constantly be reminded 
that they were sinful. The only thing the shadow could do was remind them that they were screw-ups, condemned. That's it. Sounds a lot like what I prescribed our predicament to be. They had a constant day-in, day-out reminder that they were sinners, that they were scarred. Reminders. That's all they had. But they had a shadow. God had given them a shadow so that they would be looking for something that was better. Look at verse 5. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written for me in the scroll of the book. And when he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, those were offered according to the law. Then he had it, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. The verse 7 and 8 there is a quote, or 6 and 7 is a quote directly from the Old Testament, from Psalms 40. It is a direct quote quote from the Old Testament, Jesus speaking through the prophets. The author now emphasizes for us some things that have been pointed out that Jesus was a shadow of something better. The shadow of the law said that these things had to be done. Sacrifices need to be made. Animals needed to be killed. The shadow or the sacrifices were not God's remedy for the problem of sin. They were pointing toward the solution, which was Jesus coming to heal us from our sins. Jesus comes to take away the first system, and he now establishes a new system. He takes away the offerings in the shadow to establish a new offering. He comes to do the Father's will, and by his will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all. No more sacrifices. When he dies, we are redeemed. We are sanctified once and for all. Jesus comes to offer himself so that we might be made perfect. We might be made sanctified. We might be holy We might be forgiven. Our sins totally dealt with. We don't have to deal with them anymore. Through the once and for all offering of Jesus, once and for all our sins have been dealt with. In verses 11 through 14, the author is going to emphasize again and again how permanent and significant what Jesus did on our behalf. Look with me. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away our sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice of sins, he sits down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies have been made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified." That text right there should excite you. That text right there should motivate you. Do you see the picture there and the words and the illustration that's given? His words once and for all, for all time, emphasizing the permanence of Jesus' offering, taking care of all of our sins. Then he paints the picture of a priest. The priest in the old system was busy all the time, always working, standing up, moving, making sacrifices, praying for the people. He was constantly working, constantly busy, trying to take care of the sin, but never able to remedy the problem of sin. All they were doing was producing a constant reminder, listen, you're sinful, you're screwed up, there's a shadow coming. That's all they could accomplish. They were always standing because it was necessary to do something again and again and again because sin has no remedy. But Jesus comes and he offers himself on the cross once and for all. And in that offering, he now goes to the Father and sits at the right hand of God and he's not busy working for us again to try to offer sacrifices for us. It is done. It's finished. It's complete. He's no longer busy trying to 
remedy the problem of sin. He's taken a seat next to God the Father because of his work of forgiveness is accomplished completely in his offering. You are forgiven if you've placed your faith in Jesus. And there is nothing else that needs to be done in order to accomplish your forgiveness. It's done. You're forgiven. Perfect. Perfect. You're forgiven. That needs to sink into our hearts. That needs to sink into our lives. Here we are coming to the last couple months of the year. In a couple of weeks, a lot of us will begin to start thinking about New Year's resolutions, right? And we'll start making plans of things we want to accomplish next year. If you're the type that makes resolutions, some of you will think about what kind of physical habits do you want to create, start next year in your life? A lot of resolutions revolve around what we want to do with our bodies. Wouldn't it be a lot easier if on January 1st or December 31st, you received a letter from a friend or a family member that said, you can have a lifetime membership to any gym of your choice. It's paid for. You don't have to pay a single penny. Whatever programs you want, you can have. Whatever you want to do, it's taken care of. You just have to go and participate in it. Some of you will be the type where you will get super excited about it. You'll get to the gym. You'll meet the body trainer. You'll get on a diet plan that they recommend. You'll go and start working out, and you'll do it consistently, faithfully, till about spring break. And then you're done. Spring break hits. You go on vacation, and you get back, and life gets busy, and you forget about it. And it's about summertime, and you realize summer's coming, and I need to get back into the gym. So you get back into the gym for a little bit. Then summer hits. You go on more vacations. And then semester starts again, or things. you go back into the routine of life, and you forget about it, and you never go back. Some of you, you are go on here and there. You go whenever you want to go in. The first group of people... You'll look back at the end of the year and you'll look and say, you know, I had this gift that was offered to me. I really wish I had taken advantage of it. Others of you, you might go here and there whenever you want to go, um, but not consistent, not faithful, not enjoying it. And it does you a little bit of good. Thanksgiving hits and Christmas hits and all you do is eat and eat and you make the resolution again and you're good at it for a little bit, but you haven't really effective. You haven't really taken advantage of it. And you look back and says, I enjoyed some of the benefits, but I really should have taken advantage a little bit more. And then there's some of you, um, you workaholics and um, fitness freaks, that if you had that offered to you, you would take advantage of everything. Every class that was offered that you wanted to do, you'd be involved. You'd be at the gym early in the morning. You would go after work. You would make sure you were fit. The personal trainer would be there. I mean, if the personal trainer could come to your house and follow you around, they'd do it. It's all paid for anyway. And you would absolutely enjoy the benefits of it. It's all been given to you. Everything is at your disposal. But the benefit of the gift really rests on what you do with it. The first group, the second group, and the third group all had been offered lifetime membership at the gym. How you enjoy the benefit is really up to you. Listen, Christ paid for your membership to his family, to his gym, if you want to continue the analogy. The only way you get into the gym is if you're forgiven. You don't get through those doors if you're not forgiven. But he's paid the price, and you were forgiven once and for all. But the benefit of that membership rests in your court. That's what verses 14 through 18 is about, that Jesus Christ has perfected for all times those who he has sanctified. Do you know what Jesus is doing right now while he sits on the throne next to the Father in heaven and waits for his enemies to be under his footstool? Do you know what he's doing? He's helping you and me enjoy the benefits of being forgiven by God. The degree to which you enjoy the benefits of your forgiveness really rests on you. The offer has been placed. It has been given to you. But if you live in guilt and condemnation, it's because you haven't taken advantage of the benefits that God has given you. 
If you live your life saying, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough, I've got to keep earning this, I've got to keep doing this, it's because you're not enjoying the benefits of what God has given you when he says you are forgiven once and for all. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to work. You are forgiven. And to help you, he sends the Holy Spirit to live inside of you, and the Holy Spirit is constantly encouraging you. Look at verse 15. The Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their heart and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is no longer any offering for sin. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is constantly reminding us that our We have a new heart, and on that heart is written the law of God, a mind that has now written on it the law of God, the ways of God. Do you know how that happens? See, God doesn't take our heart that has been calloused by sin, that has been scarred by sin, that has been hardened by sin, and write the law on top of it. What he does is he removes that heart completely. And he gives us a new heart. And on that new heart, before sin has even tried to tarnish it, he writes his laws on it. And it gives us a new mind, transforms our mind, and he writes his ways on it. And so now it's a pure heart. We have been purified by God. And he gives us something new. And it's written on the nicest, most shiniest letters, the law of God. And do you know what happens to the heart that is brand new, that the law of God has been written on? It is never again scarred by sin. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. Not a single sin that you have done can put a scar on your heart because the That heart has written on it the law of God, and the heart has been given to you because of Jesus who fulfilled the law perfectly. And you now have his perfection making your heart, marking your heart. Listen, the scars of Christ that he experienced when he went to the cross, the beatings that he took, the pains that he bared, The scars that he bore eradicated the scars of our lives. We're forgiven. And in case you needed more encouragement, the Holy Spirit says to you, all of your sins he will never remember. They are forgotten forever. I've got a new heart that cannot be scarred by sin. And I have the word of the Spirit speaking to me consistently, reminding me I belong to Jesus. I belong to God. I am his child. Sin has no hold over my life. Sin cannot destroy me. I am God's. Listen, is there a better message than that? Is there a better hope than that? If you're struggling this morning in sin, is there better encouragement than you being reminded by the Spirit of God this morning? Listen, you belong to Jesus. He is fighting for you. He is with you. He will never give up on you. You are his. No matter what you're going through this morning, no matter how hard you're struggling this morning, no matter how discouraged you're this morning, the Spirit of God is here reminding you you're his. You belong to him, and he is with you. You know what that means? I don't have to compare myself to someone else to make myself feel better. I can look at my life and see the blood bought, that I have been blood bought by Jesus, that God has approved me, that God has accepted me, And I don't have to make myself feel good because I'm better than someone else. I don't have to prove myself. 
I can get out of the system and just accept that Jesus died for my sins and recognize that he forgives me. I don't have to try to be better so that I can feel better about myself. Jesus gave me his perfection. I can feel really good about what he has done for me, not what I have done for him. Imagine a young man in love. This is way back in the day before the internet came out and you can meet one another, FaceTime all the time, back in Charles's day. Um, uh, and there was no internet for you could FaceTime all the time. And, the only, and these guys were separated by oceans, but they were in love. And the only thing that this man had was a picture of this girl. And he held that picture all the time. And he saw, and he constantly looked at the picture, and the picture reminded him that across the ocean was a woman that he was in love with. Finally, the two get married. The photo's still there, but now he has her. He doesn't have the photo anymore. Can you imagine one day he begins to behave strangely? He stands before his wife, and he's holding the photo in his, to his chest, and he says, I really missed you, photo. And I'm going back to it, and he passionately kisses the picture on the photo and goes out the door mumbling, I love you, dear photo. I love you, dear photo. You're everything to me. That'd be a weird, weird picture. We'd rightly conclude the guy's a moron because the person is right there, and he's kiss, kissing a shadow of something. But that guy's weird behavior illustrates what people do when they abandon Jesus to go pursuing, trying to earn their salvation on their own. It's already been done for you. You have what is best. You don't need to go back to try to prove yourself to God. You don't need to prove yourself to other people. You have Jesus. He is with you every step of the way. He has perfected you. He has saved you. He has sanctified you. He has called you a part of his family. His father calls you sons and daughters. You have what's absolutely best. And listen, you didn't do a single thing to get that status. It was given to you because Jesus paid the price on your behalf. And for you to run back and say, I've got to prove myself. I've got to earn this. I've got to make myself look better than other people. Is you are giving up what's good for a picture. And you would call that guy a moron. But isn't that what we do all the time with our lives? Isn't that what you do in your relationship with God? God, approve me because of all the things I do. God, accept me because of how I live. God, bless me because I'm better than so-and-so. That's not why God accepted you. That's not why God approved of you. That's not why God called you a part of his family. You are accepted on the basis of Jesus. You are accepted because God sent his son to die for you. Do you know what the Father, the Son, and the Spirit wants us to do in response to this message? Only one thing. He wants us to worship Him, to thank Him, to enjoy the gift of forgiveness. Do you know how you start doing that? By remembering your forgiveness. Stop remembering your sin. Stop remembering your past. Stop remembering your failures. Stop remembering your history. And start remembering your forgiveness. Start remembering that you have been bought by the blood of Jesus. Start remembering that a price was paid for you, that you are no longer identified by what you used to do. You are now identified as the son and daughter of God. Stop remembering your sin. Stop thinking about your sin and thinking that God is against you. Stop remembering your sin. Start remembering your forgiveness. Don't think that you're a sinner condemned. You're forgiven. 
Forget your forgiven sin. Remember your forgiveness. Listen, that's how you worship Jesus who gave his life for you. That's a message that will change your life if you let it. That's a message that this world needs to hear. I had a really, really good illustration to close this message, but I can't remember. It sucks. You ever forget something you were supposed to do? And you have like these post-it notes or alarms that you set up to remind you constantly or um, write it on your hand or whatever you do to remember? You ever forget to do something and you've got to have these constant reminders to make sure that you do it? Listen, whatever it takes, whatever you have to do, whether it's a thousand post-it notes on your bathroom mirror or on your bedroom wall, wherever it is, don't forget you are forgiven. If you need to set an alarm that reminds you through the day and says, God has saved you, and that motivates you to live your life, do it. Whatever it takes, don't go back into performance. Don't go back into trying to earn God's favor. You are forgiven. Whatever you need to do to remind yourself of that, do it. And then that will change how you live every day. Enjoy your forgiveness. That's how you live a life of worship. That's how you live day in and day out, worshiping Jesus. This morning we come to the communion table. This table speaks to us of the fact that God sent his son to die so that we can be forgiven. It doesn't say that we were good enough to come it says that he was worthy to be the perfect sacrifice on our behalf. And so we come to the table in worship. We come in reverence, recognizing that a great price has been paid for our sins. We come in worship. I'm gonna invite you to examine your heart, examine your lives, a life of worship declares, God, have your way with my life. God, transform me. Examine your hearts to see if there's anything in your life that isn't like Jesus. And would you come to him and ask him for repentance? Ask him for forgiveness. He's ready to forgive. And then I invite you to come, grab the elements from the table when you're ready. Those of you who are new, the way we do communion here at Loft, you pray, you examine your heart. The elements will be ready there at the table. You come and you grab them and you come back to your seat. And in a few moments, I'll come up and we'll partake of it together. But would you examine your heart? Are you living your life day in and day out knowing that you have been forgiven by God? Or are you living your life trying to prove whether to God or to other people, how good you are. Father, this morning as we come, would you help us to live our lives remembering our forgiveness? Would you help us to forget our past sins? Would you help us to forget how we've messed up? Would you help us to remember day in and day out what you have done through Jesus on our behalf? Wash us anew. As we come to this table, we come in worship thanking you for sending your son to die on our behalf. 
we are so grateful that you loved us even before we loved you. We love you this morning. In Jesus' name.